Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead. That's right. Yeah. I would like you to bring him on with a round of applause, brothers and sisters. Your brother, he's not a minister, but he's our brother. He is a minister. Our brother and your brother, Dr. Wesley Muhammad True Islam. Excellent. that Moshana who Elijah Muhammad is his living and exalted Christ. I further bear witness that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is their divine reminder sitting in the seat of the Christ in his absence by Allah's active will and permission. In their names I greet you all, us all. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu sir. Thank you for your patience with us. We apologize for going over time. Um, we will try to, I will try to wrap this up in a timely fashion. Um, we gathered here at Savings Day 2011 to offer and to engage in a scientific analysis of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings on God. That's a tall order, yes, sir. Brother Robert. Yes. A scientific analysis mm. on a religious claim mm. Mm. about God. Go ahead. While such a proposition is absurd, in many religious communities, for it threatens religious doctrine. That's right. Our Islam is mathematical. Very much. As such, it avails itself to scientific analysis and scientific scrutiny. I don't know about you. But I fell in love with the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad 20 years ago because it proved over and over again to be fact friendly. Yeah, fact friendly. Science pattern. And so I, as a believer, never had to suspend my God-given intellectual faculties in order to believe. Islam is mathematics. But a scientific religion, if you will, is a two-edged sword in the hand of believers. For while it has its privileges, security, a scientific religion, a religion compatible with facts, believers in such never have to fear the rug of faith being pulled from under them. But a scientific religion also has its birth. Right. 
burdens which believers in a non-scientific religion unburden. Savior said Islam is mathematics and mathematics is Islam and it can be proved in no limit of time. But that means our Islam is not exempt from the burden of proof. And we as believers must stand ready to prove it whenever called upon to do so. <laughs> Go ahead. We can't shirk our responsibility. Go ahead. By declaring, take it. Let it go. That's right. Go ahead. Don't work. That's right. And nobody taking it today. That's right. This age of cynicism and agnosticism. That's why none of the doors in any of our mouths are busted down, right. are lost by right. trying to hear the, this mathematical theology, right? Our own children right. are being kidnapped yes. by ideology other than Islam. Gangs, Afrocentricity, or the so called culture of hip hop. We're losing our children to all of these other ideologies because take it and let it alone don't cut it today. They just assume let it alone. That's right. Go ahead, So it's incumbent upon us as believers who are all ministers and hope. Brother Demetri would have included that slide because that was such a powerful find. Yes. Brother Demetri cites an article wherein the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said all believers That's right. are ministers. That's right. Yes, sir. That's right. all believers. And so all of us may must make ready the right. proofs and to prepare to argue in the best of manners. Yes, right. And certainly the best of manner will be that manner that best guarantees success. Yes. So we're talking about a scientific analysis. I would like, beloveds, in a few moments that I have to put on the table a scientific methodology which I believe is not only relevant but critical to our endeavor to scientifically analyze the teachers of Honorable Elijah Muhammad on God, please. Um, I would like to put on the table philology. There's so many sciences that we can, we should, before this fight is over. And one, before the death settles and smoke clears, we will be called upon to engage all of these sciences. Because Islam is everything. Everything. It's a science of everything. So all of the sciences of life must be brought to bear. Go ahead. Yes, sir. On proving that's right the truth of God. Yeah. But we can't go all over the world today. So with the brief time that I have, I would like to put on the table one scientific methodology: philology. The study of a language is grammar, vocabulary, style, literary history and cultural context. Philology is important because it not only helps us more accurately read and understand scripture, but it's important also because it protects the word of God from being theologically and dogmatically manhandled by those unhappy with what the scripture actually says. Mm. and therefore want to make it say 
what they think it should sell. They want to make it do what it don't, please. An example of the relevance of the science of philology in or to this question of the reality of God. Now, let me be real clear. Philology. There are people who quote the scripture. The Bible and the Quran. But they're actually not quoting the scriptures. That's right. They are not doing exegesis, bringing out of the scripture what is there. They're doing eisegesis. Right. <laughs> they're reading into the scripture what they want to be there. And it just so happens that such isogenic moves folks like to bludgeon us with in the nation of Islam. They like to bludgeon us not with the Quran or the words of Allah in the Quran. They want to bludgeon us with the words about the valley but make us believe that it's the words of Allah in this book, the Quran. Right. Right. To bludgeon us with the Bible. Mm. King James Bible. Mm. Come on. Mm. And make us believe that they are refuting us with the word of God. Right. Philology demands that these texts be read in the light of the linguistic requirements. Come on. In the light of the grammar of the text. Yes, in sir. terms of vocabulary, what does the word mean? Well, I don't care what you think it means. Right? I'm not asking you. I'm not interested in what you say it means. What is the philological importance of that term. That means what did it mean at the time it was written and immediately before it. Don't give me a 2011 definition of a 4,000 year old word. Definitely don't give me a 2011 English definition of a 1,000 year old Arabic word or 4,000 year old Hebrew word. Philology. <laughs> Precludes all of that. Because it makes it all useless. <laughs> so, the science of philology is a science that is helpful, to say the least, in our endeavor at a scientific analysis of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings on God. So I would like to just cite a few examples of the utility of this science of philology for our efforts at a scientific analysis in route to mm. prove Come on now. that what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said about God, he was right. And everyone else was wrong. So, public announcement. The God of this book is a man. You might ask, what is that for? You might have thought. You didn't need to ask that question. You thought you knew what this book is. You maybe thought I was talking about this book. But these are two different books. This is a Hebrew Bible. That is to say, the Bible in its original 
Hebrew. Right, right. Come on, brother. This is King James Bible. The Bible of King James and his five team of translators. Amen. These are fundamentally different books. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Doc. It cannot be said, no, nor will I say that this particular edition of the Hebrew Bible, a Masoretic text that goes back to around anywhere from the 10th to the 15th century, uh, I cannot stand before you and make the claim that this book is the Word of God. I can't make that claim. There are earlier versions in the Masoretic text that make us qualify what we find in the Masoretic text. I can stand before you and confidently say that the words of God are in this book. All right. Um, on the other hand, this is all the word of King James. Mm. Not that he doesn't get it right sometimes. Mm. He does. Sometimes. But they say his words. Some of his words are right, some of his words are wrong. But make, let's be real clear. These are, this is the word of King James. It's not the word of God. These are two different books. And so from this point on, I shall dispense with the word of King James because that can't help us ultimately. The God of this book, the Bible, is a man, and I make this point as an illustration. See, Brother Anthony does phenomenal work on the theophanies in the biblical text. God appearing to people in the form of a man, but as Brother Lennox Anthony points out, see these scholars, they try to get yeah. slick with yeah, this. That's yeah. right. Speak of the various manifestations. Yeah. Come on now. So that human theophany is not really him, right? <laughs> he condescends, right? Into a temporary, momentary, theophonic boom. He's a spirit that condescends in human form, so they would say, well, those theophany narratives, they don't prove Elijah Muhammad claim that God is a man. He's not a man. He just, if he wants to, he will condescend into man. But I'm sorry, the God of this book appears in human form in memo. He never appeared as a burning bush. Come on now, right? Come on now. That's now the Hebrew says. That's another story for another time. The God of this book appears when he chooses to do so as a man or in the form of a man because he is literally a man. This book declares it over 11 times. For example, Yahweh is Milchemat. Yahweh is a man. Of war, please. Each. Yahweh is a Gibor Yoshia, a mighty man of war. See, he is a man. The book declares it, and this is why he, when he appears and people see him and they don't die, they see a man. All right, fine. I'm sorry, I said I wasn't quite finished. <laughs> I thought I was. Um, the gift that keeps on giving. God <laughs> is a man. But here, it says clearly God is not a man. That he should lie. No, a son of man that he should repent. We've heard that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Our brother, Pastor Fred Price, yeah. 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 presumes to bludgeon us with this, right? Elijah Muhammad says, this is what he says. Elijah Muhammad says God is a man. The Bible, the word of God says God is not a man. Who's right and who's wrong? His conclusion is, you know, Elijah's wrong, God is right. Well, Elijah and God are right, Fred Price and King James are wrong. Yes, sir. Right. Go ahead. This is King James' word. That's right. That's right. This is what philology is critical. Yes, sir. Critical, please. Mm. 
Because that's not what the Hebrews said. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> There's a minor oversight. A minor change that has profound, a minor grammatical oversight that has profound theological significance. See, uh, lo ish er, we kazeb, God is not a man who lies. See, that little red line, the wild, no, in, in terms of vocabulary, of linguistics, that is a, a syntax, that's a relative part. Right. Hmm? All right. All right. Yeah. The particle, well, I, Brother Wesley, am not a man who lies. Right. Who lies? It qualifies, right? It relativizes, right, the subject. So I, Brother Wesley, am not a man who lies. Am I denying my manhood? No, sir. Am I denying my humanity? No, sir. I'm denying that I'm a liar. Right? <laughs> Philology requires respecting the syntax. Yeah. But what King James did was eisegesis right. into right. this right. text right. and robbed God. Man, 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 qualifies what kind of man he is and he ain't. Now, I know that's not that's right. good right. linguistics, ain't. Yeah. Uh, but I just seen that ain't move. <laughs> <laughs> the word first belongs to him. Philology. God is not a man who lies. Please. Well, that was introductory. The argument would be the God of the Bible is a man. Fine. What's that have to do with um, this book, the Quran? Well, if we respect the Quran, it has everything to do with the Quran. For Allah says, and are you not with the people of the book except by what is best? Say such of them as act unjustly, but say we believe in that which has been revealed to us and to you. Talking to the people of the book, the Jews and Christians, the biblical folk. We believe, Muslims say to the people of the book, people of this book, say to them, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and to you. We must, we believe in this. And our God and your God is one. Is the same. Come on. Well, if the God of these two books are the same by this book's confession, if this book is a man, then what is the God? If the God of this book is a man, what now. is the God of this book? Come on now. Beautiful. Yes, How sir. can the God of this book be other than a man? Yes, sir. Memo number two. The God of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a man. Go ahead. If the God of the Muslim world today is not a man, it is because the, God, the Muslim world today uh, is as far removed from the Islam, from the Sun of the Holy Prophet, as the East is from the West. Right. Come on, come on. It is what it is, but certainly I can't just say that. You leave it there. We're 
talking about. You gotta prove it. Prove it. Come on, now. Proof. Proof. So you throw something like that out there. That's right. You better be prepared <laughs> to make your word bond. Yes, sir. Well, come on. You know. The God of Prophet Muhammad, his God was a man. He said so. We are told the message of God, and this is in Adara Kutney, who wrote a book. Adara Kutney was the leading Adit scholar of the 10th century. And he wrote a book about seeing God. Well, no, his book was a compilation, a collection of all our deep reports about seeing God. And about 60 of these reports treated Prophet Muhammad's seeing of God or Prophet Muhammad's theophonic encounter with God. This is one of them. Uh, the message of God said, I saw my Lord in his most beautiful form like a young man, Shad. With his head to his ear low, sitting on the throne of grace, around him a gold carpet. He put his hand between my shoulders and I felt this coolness in my liver. Right? Now, the description, this description, and this Hadith report of God as a shad, as a young man. It was authenticated by the most authoritative Hadith scholars. You can't run and say because it's not in Bukhara. Right. This is not authentic. Right. I don't have time to go into the Persian Al Bukhara yeah. and what his Sahih collection really accomplished. Right. Right? Oh. But, you know, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, even Asayuti. I doubt me. Huh? I Timothy. Huh? Let us know that Al Bukhari was one among many in his day. And the Sunnah is to be located huh? in texts outside of Al Bukhari. Mm. And this particular description of God that the prophet encountered, when he encountered God, he encountered a shad, a young man. Listen was authenticated by some of the greatest Hadith scholars. I don't have time to get into it now, maybe in question and answer, if there's some doubt and cynicism, uh, we can deal with it during that time, please. But they try to, Muslim scholars try to, the same trickery. Right. Well, okay, after being forced to concede the fact that Prophet Muhammad had a theophonic encounter. He experienced God as a young man. You know, they try the same trickery. Well, that wasn't really God. Uh -oh, uh -oh. That doesn't mean God is a man. He just condescended uh -huh. in the form of a man for the purpose of communicating to Muhammad. Well, um, that ain't Prophet Muhammad's teaching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That can be your religion if you want. That's not the religion of Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad was explicit. His God is a shot. Huh? Now, this is Bukhari. This is Muslim. Huh? But even if it wasn't, it would still be a. This Bukhari centrism. It's part of what I call the Aaronization of Islam. Yeah. The hijacking and the whitening of Islam. Right. And the spookification right. of Islam. Right. Right. I'm sorry, Bukhari right. was a part of that process. All right. All right. Come on now. Yes, it is. Oh, man. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad called his God a shock. Yes. Now, now, more time I get into the syntax of this text. Can't get into it right now, but let not your heart worry. <laughs> the syntax is clear. Prophet Muhammad is here calling his God a shock. 
So, what is a shot, please? Yes, sir. Our Maori tells us a shot is a person, an individual, a man. A man. Ibn Manzor, a shot is a denotes the bodily or corporeal form or figure or substance of a man. Ibn al Jawzi, the term shot implies the existence of a body composed of parts. For one term, something a shot because it possesses bodyliness and height. That's what Prophet Muhammad's God was by his own admission. His God was a shot. Now, a man. I make that point to establish my illustration. Last illustration. The relevance of philosophy. The God of Prophet Muhammad. As we learn from his sunnah and we discussed yesterday, the sunnah clarifies the Quran. Whereas the Quran is somewhat ambiguous in that it's not explicit one way or the other. It doesn't say explicitly like the Bible says he is a man. Uh, the Quran doesn't explicitly say he's a man, but it doesn't explicitly or even implicitly say he's not a man. Right, right, right. That's right. Claims to the contrary notwithstanding. That's eisegesis, right. which the philology busts up. Right. So the God of the Sunnah is a man, please. But the Quran says, and we are frequently bludgeoned, or our, this claim is objected to on the basis of a number of passages in the Quran. I've dealt with some of them, no. Surat Tashura, the lights of Kamith B. Shea, there's none like him. We dealt with the philology of that and we impeached their interpretation with which they bludgeoned us right, with. Right. We impeached that, it's dead, wow. it's gone. Read about it in the history books. <laughs> The history of Muslim intellectual thought. Yes, we discussed Swatow Iklas, the other version, the other verse that they tried to bludgeon us with, but we impeached um, their spookified reading of Iklas. Iklas is a friend of Sahih Allah is one. Allah is here for nothing in the pen. Guess not, knows we got it. Now, like unto him, they think that to be guess not, knows we got it. Knows a dagger in the heart of our claim that he's a man. Um, I can't get into it now, but please forgive the um, shameful plug. <laughs> but I deal with it in detail. Shrat al Iglas in my new book, Take Another Look the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Islam of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I go into detail with short out it last, so I won't not. But there's some other, uh, two other verses I want to touch on and I'm going to end. Right? Um, because they are also from that pool of verses. The, among the five smooth stones that they like to try to sling at us. Right? Um, how, Brother Wesley, and you black Muslims, can God be a man when the Quran says, you know, God says in the Quran, I don't desire from them sustenance, nor do I will that they feed me. So God don't need any food. How can God be a man and not need food? We know men, humans need food. So this clearly gives the lie. To your plan. No, oh, no, sir. No, sir. See, here, it's not so much philology that corrects that error, uh, but a careful reading. Right, right, right. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. That's all. Cause see, That's all. nowhere does it say God doesn't need food. That's right. That's right. That's nowhere. Right. 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 Right
from them. them. Right. Sustenance. Yeah. Who's the them? <laughs> I don't desire from them sustenance. Nor will, nor do I will that they feed me. See, the sower is about the gin and the men, right? And how men rely on gin and men. God, y'all are telling us. No, uh, not that I don't need, but I don't need to get fed by y'all. I'm depending on y'all for my sustenance to throw this out as the claim that, or as the evidence that Allah doesn't need sustenance and thus can't be a man. Well, that's you talking. That's not the word of Allah talking. Okay, that's a softer one, please. <laughs> My final one. All right, well, this is where I go for lot. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. Come on. We know this one, don't we? We Muslims, right? Who ever engaged Muslims? We know this. Well, how can God be a man? Come on now, come on now. And we five percenters know this too. And that should have lied to everyone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm not getting sectarian. You are the five percent in this poor part of the planet. That's right. That's right. They say, how can you be God? Hmm? Say, then you go to sleep last night, you got crust still in your eye. You just woke up. <laughs> You're not God. <laughs> well, the Quran says he neither sleeps nor slumbers. Right. Yeah, I don't sleep. That's right. Except that's not what it says. Right. Clear. One more. Okay, two more. There you go. Hey, take your time, dog. That's right. Lack. Who do who? See that tomorrow. Wow. Now I'm on lock. That's not me that sleeps no song. Neither sleep nor slumber overwhelm him. Let's <laughs> understand what's going on. <laughs> he doesn't sleep, laugh, get mad with He doesn't sleep. That's not what's here. What's here is neither sleep nor slumber overwhelm him. Go ahead, teach. God, teach. He don't sleep. But, no, he can resist as he will, but he sleeps, right? You know, I'm reminded of, you know, the Savior, Master Farad Muhammad. Yeah, right? yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. We're told that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad never That's saw right. him sleep. That's right. And so he would... You know, he wanted to get a handle on it. Right? So he was, he was trying to catch him sleeping. He would look through that hole and the God looking back at the Now, I don't never seen Master Brown Muhammad never slept. But, but he could resist sleeping when he wanted to to make a point to his service. Right? Your slumber overcomes him. So philology restores the word of God. Yes. It protects us against the manipulations, the dogmatic manipulations of man handling the word of God. And if, yes, if you want to argue with us, you can object to our claim on the basis of 
your theology. <laughs> you can't do anything about that. You can spin, you can wax theological all day long. You can spin theology after theology. Right? And we can't do anything with that. But you can't come to us with these in object. So in my close, I just want to make this point because I would be remiss if I did. Go ahead, do it. Talking about scientific analysis. Talk about mathematical theology. It's real important that we understand what we are saying. Yes, sir. And don't play. If we are going to ride this bus called mathematical theology, right. then, you know, we got to stay on it. That's right. Don't jump off of it. That's when it gets a little bump. Right. What am I saying? See, I say, no, we who believe in a scientific religion, no, that has its privileges yeah. and its burden. Right? What happens when math, science, conflicts with what we understand in our theology? What do we do then? We shift into that non-scientific religion? No, sir. Come on. See, you understand what we're saying? Yes, sir. If we are believers in a scientific religion today, when the proofs seem to make it a good day for us, <laughs> what about those days when the proofs, when the science, when the math right. give us trouble? Right. I didn't say give Islam trouble. Islam right. is mathematics. Mathematics is Islam. Islam will never have problems with facts. But our understanding of this Islam may run into trouble with facts. And then what do we do? We jettison, we switch into non-scientific religion. No, we don't we have use of facts when they support what we believe about Islam. But we have no use of facts when they contradict what we believe of Islam. I didn't say contradict Islam. Facts never contradict the Islam of honorable Elijah Muhammad. But they may very well conflict with how we think we understand the Islam of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. What do we do then? Jump ship? No, sir. I suggest to us Come on. in closing that Islam is mathematics. Mathematics. And it can be proven in no limited time. That's right. If there's a seeming conflict, there would never be a conflict between mathematics and Islam. If there's a conflict in our mind, mm -hmm. we don't need to throw out our religion mm -hmm. or throw out mathematics. We just need to get our mind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Asalaamu As Alaikum.